Good afternoon. I'm Mallory Factor. I'm the West Chair, the John C. West Chair, Professor of American Government and International Relations, and I will be your guide through the conservative intellectual tradition in America. We have a very exciting speaker today who's going to be addressing us on fusion and the three-legged stool of conservatism, William F. Buckley, Jr., who really is considered the founder of it. But before I introduce our speaker, there's a number of people that need to be thanked. First, per, first is the um, Intercollegiate Studies Institute, without whose help this program at the Citadel would not be possible. And most important of all, um, our speaker's wife, Donna Keene, without whose help this program would not have happened. And we thank them all very much because without them, we wouldn't be able to bring this to you. Most people know our speaker as the new president of the four million member National Rifle Association of, the, of America. Others have known David Keene, our speaker, as the 27-year chairman of the American Conservative Union. That's the nation's oldest and largest grassroots conservative lobbying organization. During his 27-year tenure, he dramatically grew the ACU and established its conference, CPAC, as the most important conservative gathering in the world. However, most people know little of David's conservative beginnings. As a student, David Keene served as editor of Insight and Outlook, the oldest student conservative political journal. Shortly after its founding by Bill Buckley, Keene became an active member of the Young Americans for Freedom. He became the organization's national chairman in 1969. Keene was personally men mentored by a famous person of the conservative movement by the name of Frank Myers. He is really considered the father of fusionism, which we're going to be talking about today. And fusionism, as I mentioned a moment ago, is the idea that the conservative movement is made up of separate wings. At that time, Frank Meyer was saying three, social, defense, and economic. And Frank Meyer was also an editor of the National Review. Keene was a confidant and advisor to William F. Buckley, Jr. and his entire family. Keene even had a Buckley sister, Pat Bozell, as his assistant. Through his co close relationship with the Buckley family, he became executive assistant to New York Senator Jim Buckley, the only conservative party candidate ever elected to the United States Senate. Bill Buckley and David Keene not paths not only continually crossed, but their lives were intricately woven together in the conservative movement as we know it today. Keene today is recognized as one of the chief spokesmen for conservative principles and politics, and he is central to the Buckley legacy. With great pleasure, I, I, I now introduce David Keene. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me begin by thanking Mallory and indeed the Citadel for this opportunity to talk to you about my old friend and mentor Bill Buckley. You should know that the opportunity to attend a course like this is almost unique in American higher education. Uh, I'd like to um, just begin uh, by um, reading a reference to this sort of thing from the Chronicle Review, the Chronicle of Higher Education, written not too many years ago by a Columbia professor. He says, the unfortunate fact is that American academics have until very recently shown little curiosity about conservative ideas, even though those ideas have utterly transformed American and British politics over the last 30 years. A look at the online catalogs of our major universities confirms this. Plenty of courses on identity politics, post-colonialism, nary a one on conservative political thought. Professors are expected to understand the subtle differences among gay, lesbian, and transgender studies, but I would wager that few can distinguish between the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation, and the Cato Institute, three think tanks 
that have had greater impact on Washington politics than the entire Ivy League. So in many ways, uh, I'm privileged and I'm honored to have an opportunity to be a part of a course like this at an institution like this. Like most conservatives of my generation, I was inspired by William F. Buckley. I began reading National Review as a high school student and can honestly say that to this day, the base of my political thinking derives from two giants, Bill Buckley and Friedrich Hayek, both of whom will figure in my remarks. Though I am today president of the National Rifle Association, I served for many years as chairman of the American Conservative Union, was a follower, a friend, and an ally of Bill Buckley, and I'm here today for that reason. As I was accepting this invitation, I was reminded of what Bill's brother Jim told me he asked of his colleagues in seeking permission to attend the 40th anniversary banquet of the New York Conservative Party some years ago. Jim, as Mallory pointed out, served a term in the United States Senate as that party's nominee. And when I left the Nixon White House, he asked me to be his executive assistant. Jim eventually got a steady job as a highly respected federal appeals court judge. Judges, you know, uh, aren't supposed to participate in partisan activities, and he had to seek his colleagues' permission to attend the celebration. He told me I prevailed because I told them I wasn't being asked as an activist, but as an artifact of their successes in an earlier day. I resemble that remark. I'm here today as an artifact, or more properly perhaps as a witness to the development of a movement of which Jim and I were both a part and to the role his brother played in calling that movement into being. Before I retreat into history, though, I'd like to make a pre-announcement announcement. As many of you may know, the NRA, through the NRA Foundation, provides grants to support the shooting sports. Many of these grants are requested by college shooting teams through the Friends of the NRA State Fund. The Citadel P Pistol Team has requested such a grant, to, as the grant application makes clear, introduce promising and motivated cadet student athletes to competitive pistol shooting and allow them to represent their school on a national level. That grant application has been approved. So congratulations. <laughs> but let's get back to history. The early conservative movement was made up primarily of former Democrats or the sons and daughters of former Democrats, liberals, and even former socialists and communists. Frank Meyer, uh, who Mallory Factor referred to a few minutes ago, and who was my mentor, was, I believe, the highest ranking domestic communist ever to defect uh, from and to leave the Communist Party. He was not atypical. Like many who joined up early, I too began as a Democrat. At 15, I stood in the snows of Wisconsin during the 1960 Democratic primary, passing out literature for John F. Kennedy. That was where you might have expected me, as I came from a working-class labor family. My father was not just a working man, but a union activist. He spent years as a labor union organizer and 10 years as the president of the Rockford, Illinois, Labor Council. My mother was elected as the president of the Women's Inter uh, International Auxiliary of the United Auto Workers. And when I stood in the snow that year, they had never voted for a Republican for anything. All of that changed for me and for many of my generation because of Bill Buckley and the ideas he popularized. His influence is acknowledged by all involved in or witness to the development of the modern conservative movement. George Nash, author of The Most Thorough History, of the development of the post-World War II conservative intellectual movement in this country, has said of Buckley, and I'm quoting, he was arguably the most important public intellectual in the United States in the past half century. For an entire generation, he was the preeminent voice of conservatism. Indeed, he was. My own conversion, if you will, came about while I was still in high school about a year into the Kennedy administration. I was interested in politics, and more importantly, in ideas. Our high school librarian, perhaps a closet conservative herself, called me over to her desk one day and told me that she had ordered a copy of a book 
by an economist by the name of Friedrich Hayek, which he had now been told could not be put on the school library shelf. To the liberals of the 50s and 60s, Hayek was a dangerous radical, and for good reason. His road to serfdom was already beginning to undermine the liberal consensus. The book that had been banned from our school, though, was not The Road to Serfdom, but a book titled The Constitution of Liberty. Our high school librarian wasn't about to throw it out, so she told me I could have it if I wanted it. I did. I took it home. I read it. I still have it. As preparation for this lecture, I believe you've all read Hayek's Why I Am Not a Conservative, which was a chapter in that book, The Constitution of Liberty. Hayek, of course, was a libertarian, free market economist. The modern conservative me movement had not really come into being at the time he wrote that book. From Hayek to Buckley was an easy and a natural step. Like thousands of young conservatives, I devoured each issue of National Review and can attest to the accuracy of Nash's assessment of Buckley's importance. China's Mao Zedong once famously observed that political power grows from the barrel of a gun. But history tells us something different entirely. Political power and influence comes ultimately from the power of ideas. Back in 1936, the economist John Kenneth Galbraith, who in spite of his misunderstanding of economics was a lifelong friend of Bill Buckley's, wrote that, quote, ideas are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Madmen in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribblers of a few years back. Sooner or later, it is ideas, not vested interests, which are dangerous for good or for evil, unquote. Galbraith, of course, at the time was referring to the scribblings of Marx and the nativist German philosophers who together were to produce the monsters of the 20th century, Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, and Mao himself. But Galbraith, too, was a scribbler whose ideas came to dominate the economic thinking of politicians the world over for decades, but were ultimately discredited and deposed by other ideas that were beginning to take root as his influence peaked. William F. Buckley was all about ideas. In today's world, he would be described, not inaccurately, as a public intellectual, for he gave voice to the ideas that were to culminate in the modern conservative movement that he, more than anyone, called into being. He burst on the scene at the age of 26 with God and Man at Yale, a, a critique of the educational homogenization to which he was subjected as an undergraduate. And within a couple of years, he founded National Review, a journal of opinion that would change the world. He edited National Review for nearly four decades, churned out an estimated 350,000 published words a year while traveling the country to give speeches and debate liberals of his day on more than 500 American campuses. Buckley came to Madison, the University of Wisconsin, where I was an undergraduate for one of those speeches in the early 60s, and it was there that we first met. Think about the output of this man. During those same years, he published more than 50 books. He hosted nearly 1,500 episodes of Firing Line on public television. He was instrumental in the founding of the Intercollegiate Society of Individualists, now uh, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, the Young Americans for Freedom, which the Washington Post's David Broder later said was the most influential youth organization of its era, and the Philadelphia Society. He brought the disparate wings of an emerging new conservatism together to create a politically viable movement where none had existed. As a result of his efforts, Barry Goldwater won the Republican Party presidential nomination in 1964, transformed the GOP, and set the stage for the Reagan challenge to an incumbent president four, year, four years la later that made possible Ronald Reagan's election in 1980. To grasp the enormity 
of this accomplishment, one has to remember just what the political and intellectual landscape looked like in the years following the Second World War. In his monumental book, Commanding Heights, Harvard's Daniel Juergen describes the late 40s, 50s, and early 60s as a period in which a collectivist faith in government dominated the world. Britain had gone socialist and was busy nationalizing its industry. Sweden had already done it. Country after country was developing five and ten year plans under which the state would direct the economy. History seemed not just to be on the side of collectivism and socialism, but of communism. One has to remember or realize that when Whitaker Chambers abandoned, abandoned the communists and penned witness, he was convinced that he was leaving the winning for the losing side. In this country, establishment intellectuals like Lionel Trilling dismissed the very idea of an American conservative tradition as silly at best and pathological at worst. And even today, some psychologists view conservatism in much the same light. This was the 1955 world that young Bill Buckley set out to challenge and perhaps to change. The words of Buckley's mission statement that appeared in his new magazine's maiden issue in November of 1955 said it all. National Review, he wrote, stands athwart history, yelling stop at a time when no one is inclined to do so or to have much patience with those who so urge it. Buckley didn't know if he or we would prevail, but he knew what he had to do, and that, of course, was to try. He added, there never was an age of conformity quite like this one, and he was dead right. But as Jurgen points out in his history of the time, under the surface, things were beginning to change, and Bill Buckley was to be the catalyst for popularizing and shaping that change both intellectually and politically. Jurgen suggests that the most important publishing decision of the era was made by the Reader's Digest, which some years earlier had decided to publish and thus make both famous and influential a book by that Austrian economist, Frederick Hayek, who was then in residence at the University of Chicago. It was his road to serfdom, and it influenced the thinking of millions around the world including a young Hollywood liberal by the name of Ronald Reagan and a British undergraduate who carried a copy of the book around in her purse and grew up to become the longest serving prime minister in British history. The movement back in those days was tiny, but it was growing. Like most young intellectually based movements, it consisted mainly of academics, students and writers who spent an inordinate amount of time and energy arguing about minor as well as major doctrinal differences. There were the objectivist followers of the newly famous Ayn Rand, the remnants of the old anti-Roosevelt coalition, a scattering of isolationists and racists, states' rightists, and even a monarchist or two. There were religious extremists and conspiracy theorists. When my father's union organizing days were over, he bought a bar, as he, and as he prepared to open that bar, he gave me what turned out to be pretty good political advice that I've never forgotten. He said that when you open a bar, you have to spend the first month or so throwing out all of those who've already been thrown out of every other bar in town, because if you don't do that, he said, no one else is ever going to come in to your establishment. Conservatives in the late 50s were facing a similar problem as they tried to put together and open a movement with an appeal that wouldn't be limited to malcontents and ideologues who couldn't find a home anywhere else and who could, if they were let in, keep everyone else out. Buckley and his band of merry men and women at National Review decided that their immediate mission was to get rid of the crazies, the racists, and those who couldn't get along with others while molding the rest into a coalition that might actually both present an intellectually defensible conservatism and hope eventually to influence the nation's culture and politics. Through National Review, Buckley began knitting together supporters of different strains of quasi-conservative thought 
that he and his followers believed legitimate and capable of working in a coalition to form a viable conservative political movement. Every few years, a reporter or an analyst discovers that the conservative movement is far from monolithic, but more closely resembles a coalition of interests that differ in almost as many respects as not. When that happens, articles appear wondering if this movement can survive these different views and these strains, as if a successful political movement must be both monolithic and homogeneous to be either effective or to survive. Communists and most totalitarian ideological movements have always tried to suppress dissent and differences within their ranks, fearing, like the religious leaders of a different era in the West and of today in the Middle East, that dissent must ultimately lead to factionalism and failure. In the 1960s, three main conservative camps had sometimes conflicting but overlapping views. They were the anti-communists, who, like Buckley, Chambers, Meyer, Burnham, and the rest, saw Marxism-Leninism as an existential threat to everything they held dear. Libertarianism, a belief in limited government, free markets, and individual liberty. And what we then called traditionalism, the belief that free men must act morally to preserve those rights that they loved. Buckley and Frank Meyer believed that these three basic camps faced the very same threats. Free markets, individual autonomy, and religious freedom were all threatened by communism. The United States was a fortress of freedom in a dangerous world. Anyone who valued tradition or freedom was in the very same boat, and none could afford to push the other overboard, lest they all perish. The result was what Frank Meyer termed fusionism. Meyer rejected a valueless libertarianism, as well as state-directed virtue. The result was a belief in what he called libertarian means to a traditionalist end, a good, a good society be built by men and women freely choosing to pursue, pursue moral goals and ends. This, combined with hostility toward totalitarianism, gave him what is now referred to as the three-legged stool that makes up the conservative movement. But first, they had to throw the folks out who were keeping the others from entering. Each camp had hangers-on who could endanger the whole enterprise and therefore had to go. The first to go were the Birchers. The John Birch Society was the brainchild of a Belmont, Massachusetts businessman by the name of Robert Welch and was named for a soldier killed in Korea shortly after World War II ended by a communist Chinese soldier. Welch considered him the first casualty of the Cold War as he may well have been. The society attracted tens of thousands of followers around the country but it quickly became apparent that Welch was a conspiracy theorist of the First Order. And because there weren't very many organizations on the right, the more liberal media leaped on the John Birch Society as a way to tar the, emer the emerging conservative movement as a bunch of folks much like the John Birch Society's founders. Today one finds folks like him among the truthers and the birthers. But in those days, his bizarre theories were easily caricatured by a hostile establishment and used to tar conservatives like Buckley himself as part of what the press liked to refer to as the lunatic fringe. Buckley famously read the Birchers out of the movement, and those of us in his camp followed suit. At the time, I was a board member of the Young Americans for Freedom, which I later chaired. We passed a resolution denouncing the Birchers at our national convention. They walked out. It wasn't easy at the time, but it was politically nece necessary, and we all had a sense that it was the right thing to do. Welch had famously, or perhaps I should say infamous, infamously, suggested that President Dwight Eisenhower was a conscious agent of the communist conspiracy. Russell Kirk, another conserv conservative and, and uh, ally of Buckley's, responded, Ike isn't a communist, he's a golfer. Next to go were the objectivists, who Buckley saw as too doctrinaire and whose militant atheism offended him and offended other conservatives. 
And finally, the racists and extreme libertarians who at the time seemed more interested in selling the highways and legalizing drugs while agreeing with the so-called new left that the U.S. rather than the communist world was mainly responsible for the Cold War had to go. Remember, it wasn't just that Buckley found the beliefs of the Birchers, of the objectivists, the racists, and the monarchists objectionable, though he did, but, he was, but that he was trying, trying desperately to put together a coalition that could present an appealing and consistent philosophical message to those fed up with the direction in which the United States seemed to be heading in the 50s. Buckley, of course, succeeded beyond his wildest dreams. By 1964, the new conservatives would nominate Barry Goldwater, drive the Eastern establishment packing, or so it seemed at the time, and effectively seize control of one of the nation's major political parties. Following the Goldwater defeat, a defeat which Buckley both predicted and told young conservatives in a private meeting before the election, told them that it would be a good thing for a couple of reasons. Most importantly, the reason being that he said if Goldwater were to have won, who would run the government? Because there were not conservatives at that time who had moved beyond theoretical thinking to actually applying their philosophy to real world problems. I still remember the first book published in those days that took conservative philosophy and tried to address a concrete problem. It had begun as a PhD thesis by a young, uh, 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 a young student um, at Stanford. It was named Marty Anderson, who later served in several administrations. It was called The Federal Bulldozer, an attack on the urban renewal program uh, of the era. And I still have that book. It was important, not because of its solutions, but because it was an initial attempt by somebody to say, it's time to stop just debating ideas in the coffee house and to go out and decide what we would do if we were, in fact, in a position to do anything. But following that defeat, Buckley urged conservatives, as I say, to begin putting together this infrastructure. The infrastructure needed to train men and women to not just run for office, but to govern. He was instrumental in the formation of the American Conservative Union in late 1964. And in 1965, he ran for mayor of New York. Not because he expected to win. He famously said that if he did win, he would demand a recount. <laughs> but to demonstrate to his fellow conservatives that it was possible to mount a conservative political offensive against the liberal establishment in what most of us considered the belly of the liberal beast. Conservatives around the country listened. They followed that campaign. They cheered Bill Buckley on. They took heart, and they began filing for office themselves. They even began to win. The Republican Party had been, been declared dead by the establishment after the 1964 election. But it was open for business under new ownership. Ronald Reagan was elected governor of California in 1966 and considered running against Richard Nixon and Nelson Rockefeller two years later, uh, but ultimately decided it was too early. The result, of course, was Nixon and Watergate, and then finally, Ronald Reagan and the triumph of, mo of a movement that began as, as a gleam in the eye of young Bill Buckley. By 2007, Reagan was gone. But George W. Bush presented Bill Buckley the Medal of Freedom at a White House ceremony honoring his life, his work, and acknowledging the debt that the country and all of us owed him. By then, though, Buckley sensed that the movement he built was fraying around the edges. He was convinced that the balance that had existed among the various constituencies that made up the movement was somehow off kilter. It seemed to him that some, like the young president who placed the medal around his neck, just didn't get it. That others who had come to Washington to do good had stayed to do well. 
and that the sectarianism and hubris that they demonstrated was leading the movement down the road to potential disaster. Buckley had never been orthodox in his conservatism. He didn't believe that conservatism was ideological so much as a way of looking at life. He opposed any dissent into a doctrinaire ideological way of thinking. That was one of the reasons he had so much trouble with Ayn Rand and the objectivists. Over the years, he differed with fellow conservatives on all manner of important issues. He favored the legalization of marijuana for both libertarian and empirical reasons. The war on drugs, he felt, would never be won and was too costly to continue. But he also favored national service, mostly for empirical reasons. He looked back on the way a generation had been socialized during the 40s and 50s through military service and thought young people in the nation had benefited greatly from that socialization. Buckley supported the initial invasion of Iraq on national interest grounds, but was quickly repelled by the very idea that it might be possible, let alone advisable, to try to remake that nation in our image. He made it clear that he thought we should get out. He'd never been a follower, and when he sensed that a new generation of conservatives was leading the movement off in directions he considered politically and philosophically unsound, he spoke up. His fusionism was threatening to come apart at the seams as a result of its own success. Frank Meyer, when warned by a young activist years ago that in power, the different constituencies that made up the movement might want very different things and be willing to use the power of the state in very different ways than he foresaw, Meyer suggested that we could fight battles over those things in the basement of the White House if and when we ever ended up there. At the time, of course, the idea that we would end up there was fairly far-fetched. But we did end up in the White House. And once we got there, the differences began to surface, and be, in part because the various constituencies could surface them, and in part because many were not sufficiently socialized into the movement that Buckley had formed. In the early days, this hadn't been a problem. We argued the issues and we came to accommodationist solutions. We took all of these things into consideration and we got it. My own experience was perhaps typical, or at least not atypical. I was mentored by Frank Meyer himself, which was quite an experience. Meyer, as I said earlier, was the highest ranking American communist to defect. And in those days, the communists took that sort of thing seriously. Uh, and the Kremlin took out a contract on him. He took to uh, hiding uh, during the day and working at night, uh, ensconced in a, uh, in a, in a farmhouse uh, in upstate New York. Uh, he would get up uh, when the rest of humanity was going to bed, uh, work all night, and then sleep all day, as he had learned to do while he was on the lam. But Frank was not just the book review editor of National Review. He was the conscience of this new movement. And unlike some who defected, he would not even for a minute ex accept the fear expressed by Whitaker Chambers that he had left the winning for the losing side. Frank had never been in a battle that he did not expect to win, and he expected to win this one. Frank meant to beat the communists, and as one who had been in charge of recruiting and training new party members, he knew how to go about looking for, finding, and motivating young conservatives. Every couple of months he'd invite, or perhaps order me, to come to Woodstock, New York. I'd dutifully fly to New York, catch a bus to Woodstock, and arrive in the evening just as he was ready to start a quasi-Socratic educational session that would last far into the night. He'd want to know what I'd read since we'd last met, what I'd accomplished, and what I was going to accomplish when I got back to Wisconsin. Back in Madison, after getting some rest and sobering up, I'd get calls late in the evening from Frank Meyer, checking to make certainly I was doing what I had agreed to do and making progress in the struggle 
in which we were all involved. In between my assigned readings, I would attend workshops organized by the Intercollegiate Society of Individualists, or ISI. I would organize and debate, and if I was lucky, I might get to do a little studying. It was an exhilarating time for me and for those like me. We knew what the movement is about, but with political success it began to grow perhaps too quickly. I've observed in a different context that one can tell that an idea-driven movement is on the verge of political su success when the rats board the ship. The new recruits that streamed in added to our numbers and were well-intentioned, but there were too many to educate as thoroughly as Frank and his fellows had educated those of us who were with him in the beginning. And before long, they began to say they were conservatives not because of Hayek or Buckley or Kirk, but because they liked Reagan or Bush or Gingrich. If you took away Gingrich or Reagan or Bush and asked them then why they were conservatives, they couldn't answer that question. Our task today, and it is one in which many conservatives are engaged, is to re-socialize the core and remind new recruits of just what it means to be a conservative rather than just conservative. The distinction is all important. As witness Buckley's description of George W. Bush, quote, he is conservative, Buckley told an interviewer, but he is not a conservative. In other words, he didn't get it. In recent years, there have, re have emerged or re-emerged folks that we call paleoconservatives, national defense conservatives, social and liberal, social and religious conservatives, constitutional conservatives, big government conservatives, and neoconservatives, all trying and fighting for the right to redefine and lead the movement Buckley called into being, reminding one of the time, reminding one of the time that Al Gore, campaigning in Milwaukee, mistranslated E Pluribus Union as out of one many. A few years ago, at the Conservative Political Action Conference that Mallory mentioned earlier, we honored Bill's brother Jim and former Minnesota Senator Eugene McCarthy for their 1974 challenge to that era's campaign finance reform. In responding to the toasts, the liberal Gene McCarthy stood up and said, you conservatives have had a good run, but you are in trouble. Because I keep hearing talk of hyphenated conservatives. That's what happened to liberals in the 60s. And when they start referring to you in hyphenated terms, you are headed for a crack up. As Bill looks down on us today, he is no doubt hoping that we will be far wiser than McCarthy's liberals and that we will work as hard to preserve our coalition as he did to build it. Thank you very much.